The House of Tudor ruled England between 1485 and 1603, and its most famous monarch was probably the oft married, larger than life, King Henry VIII. Henry was well now for his many executions. He also had lots of romantic romps, in Whitblock, to be fair. But is that what life was like for his constituents in Tudor England? Not by most accounts. In fact, sexuality was even more stigmatized and not nearly as pleasant for men and women as it is for most today. Marriage in Tudor England wasn't fun for most women. Whether or not they were wives or ladies all the night in Elizabethan cat houses. Intercourse wasn't for pleasure but for the purpose of giving birth to children. Tudor life offered up some really questionable methods of Tudor contraception, and the person's age of sexual activity was pretty much at the onset of property for young women. They before either party was likely emotionally ready. So then, was the childbirth likes in Tudor times? Um, not much better. Dirty, isolated and pretty darn painful. All around, sex was pretty awful back then. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Czerny History channel. Contraception was traditionally illegal in England in Tudor times and hadn't been for several centuries. Female contraceptives still excited, but they didn't employ particularly advanced methods. Women could instead wool socket and vinegar into their vaginas. Supposedly the astrogency of vinegar closed all the womb to questing sperm. Women also plugged up the entrance to their vaginas with bees walk seals or blocks of wood. During the Tudor period, the right testicle was believed to contain all the scent necessary to sire a son, and the right side of the uterus produced boys. Accordingly, the left testicle was employed to have a daughter. In order to father a son, Tudor men tied knots around the left side of their genitals to restrict the girl producing sperm and make sure they had boys. If a guy couldn't get it up, apothecaries breathed up tons of bizarre reminders to cure what ailment. One recipe makes it quality stickles with large winged ants, bark oil and amber. Beans also supposedly assisted a man's overcoming dysfunction in the bedroom. It wasn't just every jaw suffering from impotence. By the time of his death, even King Henry VIII might have had ED. Unsurprisingly, the Tudor dynasty didn't herald in the death of equality for women. Men could punish their vice in almost any day they choose. If women there found guilty of committing adultery, their hobbies could toss them out, in theory. Men who food, their wives talk it too much, could put them in scolds bridles and drag them around. These brutal contraceptions, the iron version of horses, brittles with tan depressors so the woman couldn't speak. The Catholic Church promoted only intercourse within marriage. In a fort to control impulses, the Church suggested it should solely be for the purpose of procreation rather than the pleasure. A woman's role was to bear children, in particular, son's conceptions was king. In Tudor times, the female orgasm was considered essential to conception. In theory, the woman wouldn't emit seed of her own, aka female ejaculate, what would mix their hair partner's seed and fertilize her. Women in the Tudor period were considered of marriageable and shortly after they hit puberty. Why? What means they were able to conceive children? As a result, Upper-class parents married their daughters of an age as young as 12. Henry VII's own mom, Margaret Buford, married her first husband at age 12 and gave birth to a son, her only child, at 13. 
she was widowed what same year. But every jeans all the time were often married in their twenties. Most didn't want to bring a spouse into their parents' household. Men in particular waited until they'd made enough cash to set up their own homes. Only then would it be ideal to bring a wife to manage their new households and create a family. The book of Genesis details how Eve had the fruit of knowledge from a tree in the Garden of Eden, becoming the catalyst for the fall of humankind. As a result, men blamed women for just about everything, and so all women as inherently flawed trained by original sin. The church argued what women's lusts and desires should be maintained in the institution of marriage. Tudor sex wasn't allowed just any day of the week. For example, couples couldn't do it during religious occasions would require abstention from pleasure, like Lent. According to same historians, it was forbidden to have relations on certain days of the week, namely Wednesdays, Saturdays and Sundays. The best way to get closer to God, according to the church remain celibate. Not everyone could be so holy, though in corp, the innate desire to fornicate. As a result, marriage was the next best thing, since it meant keeping the act within the confines of the church. Later, during the Reformation, the idea of getting married and procreating was actually really good caught on. So, this is the Journey History Channel, and sorry for my English. <laughs>